brilliant speakers and we want to hear from them. Shall I get started and just welcoming everyone? Yes, yes. I know people are still joining us, but that's okay. I'm not the important one they need to hear from. Okay, welcome everybody that's joining us uh, for the very first of our seminars in the SOAS Economics Department. My name is Hannah Bagawi. I am one of two heads of department. Elisa van Weinberger is with us too in the participants. Hello, Elisa. Uh, so this is the very first of our new season of webinars. Um, that I'm delighted that Sara Stefano and Tobias Franz have been um, coordinating and they've put together a wonderful programme under the theme of intensifying inequalities and the limitations of global capitalism. Um, as we all know, COVID-19 has exposed the inequalities that already exist um, and it's also exposed the limits of global capitalism. So it's no better time than now to really discuss this. I'm just going to say um, a couple of words about SOAS economics, and that's to say that through our research and our teaching, um, we have for a long time offered alternatives and also offered opportunities to debate um, alternatives to global capitalism and exposing those intersecting inequalities. And one of the ways we've often done that has been through our seminar series that traditionally we would have had in SOAS on campus, um, that's open to students, our staff, our visitors and guests. One nice thing about us not being able to do that, perhaps one side effect of COVID-19, um, is the fact that we are doing this now online and through that we are actually open to a much wider audience than we would have if we were just on campus. So I welcome all of you that have joined us, whether you're staff, students, alumni um, or just visitors. And so we have a wonderful uh, uh, set of speakers today. Please do um, stay in touch with us, follow us. We're on Twitter, on Facebook, on various so social media channels um, and stay in touch with us. And if you're interested in SOAS Economics, go to our website where you can also find out about our previous seminar series, The Economics of COVID-19, where the recordings from last year's seminars are there as well to give you a flavour of that. But I'm going to hand you over in the very capable hands of Tobias who's going to be moderating today, and I'll let him introduce the speakers um, and take it from there. But you're very welcome, and I hope you enjoyed the first event. Thank you very much for this, Hannah. Um, and as Hannah already said, um, this uh, webinar couldn't be uh, launching at a more apt moment, um, specifically with the topic of uh, intens intensifying inequalities and limitations of global capitalism and also with that, I want to welcome you everybody um, to the SOAS Economics webinar series that Sarah, Stevano and I put together. My name is Tobias Franz, as uh, Hannah already said in the introduction. And also something that Hannah, Hannah did say, and many super, uh, uh, superlatives have been used in the paid eight, uh, past eight months to describe this current crisis, but really this is uh, an unprecedented situation um, that not only lays bare the limitations and contradictions of global capitalism and what Hannah said accentuates the underlying and ever increasing intersecting inequalities, the current crisis also fundamentally challenges the way in which we think, we write, we talk, we teach about economics. So what our webinar series is uh, trying to do is to bring together perspective that extend our understanding of how these different inequalities have been taking root in our societies and economies and how these relate to the various crises of global capitalism from um, the crises uh, starting in the 80s, 90s, the global financial crisis, but most particularly, of course, the current crisis we are living through. So the aim of this webinar series is also to reach across the disciplinary boundaries uh, to put economics in dialogue with other social sciences and center the interdisciplinarity in our department's heterodox tradition and regional expertise. So we want to foster with this, with this seminar series um, an interdisciplinary dialogue to help us better understand the challenge, challenges we face, but also to contribute to a policy discussion, to solutions um, that um, might lead to a recovery from this crisis and uh, to build a more resilient, more equal, 
and more environmentally sustainable world economy. Um, of course, uh, um, it, give, it gives me also great, great pleasure to introduce today's session, particularly um, as the launch of uh, the webinar series, um, talking about the universal basic income with perspective from periphery Europe and from Southern Africa. And just to introduce the speakers and the discussion of today, first we will have uh, Ruth Castelbranco, who uh, is the research manager for the Future of Workers Project at the Southern Center for Inequality Studies at Witts University in Johannesburg. She has a P uh, BA in Geography and African Studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an MA in Development Studies from the University of uh, KwaZulu in Natal and is currently finalizing her PhD in sociology uh, also at the University of uh, Witz in Johannesburg. Previously Ruth worked at the International Labour Office in Mozambique and on social and maternity protection. She first became interested in questions of labour as a student activist, cutting her teeth as a labour organizer in uh, DC for DC Jobs and Justice uh, yeah, in Washington, the United States. Uh, Ruth is an alumna of the International Center for Development and Decent Work, and her research interests in, include informal worker organizing and workers' rights, redistributive policies and social protection, agrarian transformation, and changing nature of work. So very uh, happy to have her start today's session um, and then followed by our very own Kostas Lapavitsas, who is Professor of Economics here at SOAS in the Department of Economics. Um, and his research during the last few years has particularly focused on the Eurozone and the financialization of capitalism. He has published widely in the academic field and writes frequently in the international and the Greek press. Uh, back in January 2015, he briefly left our department to join the Greek parliament uh, with the incoming Syriza party, but then left again in August 2015 when the third bailout of Greece was signed um, and rejoined the economics department. Uh, his most recent book inc include Capitalism and the Ottoman Balkans, uh, The Left Case Against the EU, Against the Troika, Crisis Austerity in the Eurozone, and Profiting Without Producing. Um, and also a very warm welcome to our discussant today, uh, who will be um, Shaira Kala. Shaira is a South African activist and scholar. She holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree in Philosophy, Politics and Economics, and a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science, both from WITS. And she recently completed her MSc in African Studies at Oxford and is a member of C19 People's Coalition and is currently also experiencing a little bit with filmmaking. So a very diverse and very interesting uh, panel for today. Um, and before I uh, hand over to Ruth, who will start with her 20 minute presentation, um, just a few housekeeping rules. So first and foremost, I already said that in the chat box, please do let us know from where you're joining us from. You find the chat box on the right bottom side uh, of your screen. So please just let us know where you're joining us from. And then throughout the webinar, you can please send us all of your questions um, or discussion points that, that might come up during the chat uh, of Ruth or of Costas and that we will collect in the, in the first 40 to 60 minutes of the session. Um, and then um, we, uh, I, I will collect these questions and, and give them to the uh, presenters. Um, so. Yeah, as I said, we start with Ruth, 20 minutes, then we have Costa speaking for 20 minutes. Shaira will then discuss with both of the, present, the presenters, um, and then we hand over to the questions um, that come from you guys. So please respect uh, the etiquette uh, in the chat um, and be respectful of each other. Um, and yes, this session is recorded. You will also find the recording then on the economics uh, department's web website. Um, so yeah, without further, further ado, I'll hand over to Ruth, um, who will start the session. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ruth Castelbranco. Thank you so much for the invitation. 
to be part of the seminar. Um, and it's an auspicious day to start with discussions on UBI because actually today is the Global Day of Decent Work. And in South Africa, uh, various trade union federations and the C19 coalition came together for a general strike. Um, and one of the demands is around the extension of the emergency COVID grant into universal basic income. Now, I'm not going to speak uh, about that, in, at least in this first session, because we have Shaira Kala here, who is part of the C19 coalition and can say many more interesting things about it than I can. But I think, you know, simply to raise that, of course, these are political questions and are the outcome of processes of struggle and, and, and reflect the conjunctures of power. And I think, you know, for me as a researcher, um, it's always very important to have that, to hold that front and center, even as we engage in debates about the, the structure of the labor market and the costings of UBI, that ultimately these are part of a, a, a political process of struggle. So uh, for this um, session, I'm going to focus on the crisis of reproduction and the conundrums of universal basic income in the case of Mozambique. And I'm just going to take us, sorry, let me just, the first, ah, there we go. Um, I'm still getting a hang of this program. There we go. Um, and so after looking at kind of the structure of the labor market in Mozambique and some of the problems. Um, we're going to look at the social welfare system, reflect on uh, some of the conundrums that are specific to Mozambique, and then, and then have some general reflections on universal basic income. Okay, so Mozambique has the, among the lowest unemployment rates on the African continent. So this is the strict unemployment rate according to ILO statistics. You see South Africa it was 27.3 in 2019. Mozambique was only 3.2. Um, however, when you actually dig into these numbers, you see that the vast majority of the economically active population is concentrated in small-scale agriculture, though there has been a decline in the last 10 years. Um, there's also been a a decline in industry, and then an, a rise in these rather unknown activities, right, which are actually, which the National Institute of Statistics uh, categorizes as unknown. And because they have released the raw data from the census for reasons that have to do with um, electoral politics and fraudulent elections, then we're actually unable to kind of dig into what these different categories are and what the decisions were by the National Institute in order to, yeah, define what where, but it points to what Bernstein identifies as increasingly fragmented and fluid classes of labor. And more worryingly is you see a dramatic drop in the last 10 years of the economically active population from 16.9 or 69.2 percent to 57.6 percent. And when you then look at what it means, oh sorry, this slide seems to have gotten um, confused, but when you look at what that means in terms of, um, well, what is economically active in Mozambique? The truth is that uh, the statistics uh, define employment so broadly that even the most residual activities count, right? So if you do one hour of cultivation in the past week, you count primarily as a small-scale farm, own account worker, or a unpaid family uh, worker. So the, um, the graph um, is both confused and in Portuguese, but the key point is that only 12% of Mozambique's economically active population is actually um, in uh, salaried employment. And a third of those uh, are not covered by labor or social protections. And you can see that by looking at the uh, social security data. Um, and of course, this is highly gendered. So men are overrepresented in public enterprises and private enterprises, and women are overrepresented in the residual activities such as own account work without empl employees or unpaid family work, which tends to be small scale agriculture um, for food rather than cash crops. That's sort of how the statistics get collected. Uh, and so the the, the main point is that we have low unemployment rate, a low strict unemployment rate, but actually very low levels of wage labor. And one of the interesting things, if you look, this is now the expanded uh, 
unemployment rate is that there's an inverse relationship between unemployment and poverty and malnutrition. So actually, it is often um, men in the top quintiles of the consumption distribution in urban centers have the highest rates of unemployment, and it's women in the bottom quintiles of the consumption distribution in rural areas that have the lowest rates of unemployment. Uh, and, and so this is obviously a reflection of the fact that the majority of Mozambicans have not been entirely dispossessed from the means of production, but are not able to actually meet their reproductive needs from small-scale agriculture, and are thus cobbling together a livelihood through a multiplicity of other activities that are not adequately reflected in census or household data. And even wage workers, wages in Mozambique, half of the wages are below the line of working poverty, and it's not unusual for salaried workers and to be engaged in other informal activities or to have a small farm or so. And so then, you know, the questions of unemployment in Mozambique have always been dealt with in a, in a rather uneven way, right? Because on one hand, the statistics suggest that it is not a problem. And on the other hand, we know that it is a massive problem. And I think that this quote really highlighted, this was a woman in the district of Ribawe, which is a fertile area. Um, and, and she says, when I was Born, no one spoke about unemployment. Only the occasional person with a child in the mission school was concerned with placing their child in the city. With the expansion of education, secondary schools began to offload graduates whose inclination is not to embrace the whole. While work is for everyone, employment is not. And, and that is the kind of dynamic that you're seeing, and you're seeing growing concern in Mozambique with youth unemployment in particular, because young people have their sights set on other types of activities. And without adequate state support for small-scale agriculture, it's incredibly risky and subject to the vagaries of both the weather and the context of climate change and the market. So the social welfare system in Mozambique is um, composed of two pillars. Well, one is actually social security, which is a contributory system for workers primarily, though not exclusively in the formal economy. So the government has tried in the last ten, uh, five years to incorporate informal workers into uh, the contributory social in insurance system, but the truth is that most people in Mozambique don't have contributory capacity. Um, and that covers about 750,000 people together. And then you have publicly funded social welfare, which is for poor and vulnerable adults, um, or poor and vulnerable households. So although social protection is a right, um, according to the social protection law, actually only 10% of Mozambicans have access to it, and you can't actually sue the government uh, for the lack of social rights because social rights are not recognized. Um, I think the interesting aspect about the cash transfer systems in Mozambique is that they really started as a way to grease the wheels of structural adjustment. So you see in 1990, there was only, there was less than a handful of people that were within the cash transfer that had been registered. Um, and it was introduced uh, as an initiative of the World Bank to get rid of more universal forms of social provisioning, such as uh, subsidized food um, during the socialist period. And then you kind of see an increase up to 1996, which was considered somewhat of a miracle because uh, the office at the time only had four staff, and the development agencies concerned with questions around cost efficiency lauded this as an example of improved cost efficiency, the ability to increase to 100,000 beneficiaries with a tiny team uh, of, of government officials. Of course, when they then did a re re registration, they realized that more than two-thirds of the beneficiaries were phantom names, and so the number dropped in 1997. But I think it's a cautionary tale to this kind of idea, this fantasy that cash transfers can just be uh, magically transferred from the pockets of whether it's donors or national governments uh, to the pockets of the poor, sidestepping the neo-patrimonial state. Whereas in fact, you need a very, um, a very strong state administration to be able to register and, and, and issue cash transfer payments and so on and so on. Um, and then you see a kind of bumbling of the evolution of cash transfers until 2007. And that's when you have the Livingston process in the SADC countries funded by DFID. And, and you begin to really get an acceleration of interest in cash transfers as an efficient and effective instrument of inclusive growth. 
And so the story of cash transfers in Mozambique, in contrast to South Africa, is one really that's, that's embroiled within the development world and reflects the patterns of, of international development funding. And I think that that's important as we think about the role of cash transfers in creating what James Ferguson calls uh, a radical politics of distribution or perhaps the limitations of cash transfers in the context where international development agencies have so much influence over the design and implementation of cash transfer programs. So um, the, the cash transfer program now covers about 600,000 households. And Mozambique has, has a different moment and toyed with the idea of shifting to individual uh, pro, uh, cash transfers. But the truth is that the household uh, um, approach to selection is, is, is a way of, of, of reducing the number, the total number of eligible units, right? So by using households instead of individuals, you're able to then um, uh, reduce the number. And so it's never been able, it's always ended up implementing these cash transfer programs on a household basis. And the largest is the basic social subsidy program, which is for the labor constraints, primarily elderly, um, and they get a transfer anywhere between 540 and 1,000 mitigaj, which is about $8 to $14, right? Um, and you see that as a percentage of, of the updated poverty line, that, that's you know, insufficient really to meet um, household needs. And then you have the Productive Social Action Program, which is the... Uh, for able-bodied adults of working age, and it's conditional on labor-intensive public works. And there, there's just a, a set payment of 1,050, so it really depends on the size of the household, how much that functionally ends up being. The, the latest program, which is right at the bottom, it got cut off, um, is the, uh, the Direct Social Action Emergency Program, which was expanded with the COVID pandemic. And so it provides a cash transfer equivalent to $21 over a period of six months. And it's estimated to cover over a million households. So the COVID pandemic created this opportunity to expand the cash transfer system, well, be, almost more than doubling, actually, the total number of households covered. And if you notice, the value of this cash transfer is also significantly higher than the other ones. It's focused on urban and peri-urban areas as well as the province of Cabo Delgado, which is currently under an insurgency. And I think this is the first time that the Mozambican government has actually started to think about cash transfers as a way of trying to um, appease uh, or, 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 or drive forth some kind of, of social cohesion in a sort of very targeted way. But of course, then it introduces all these other criteria, which are uh, the vulnerable, the socially acceptable vulnerable categories, which of course whittle down the number of eligible households. So they have to be headed by children and the elderly, people with disabilities, and so on. So even though it's an unconditional cash transfer and it's the first of its kind um, for able-bodied adults and it's a higher value and it, it hopes to expand over a much larger number of people, it still has all of these other forms of uh, complex selection methods built in to try to rationalize right, the number of people who are, who are eligible in the context of widespread poverty and informality. Um, so as I mentioned, there's these innovations, which are the unconditional nature, the sheer scale of the program. It's also um, funded uh, entirely by donors, whereas the other cash transfers are funded by the national budget. Um, and so what's, uh, what that's facilitated then is a kind of conditionalities. And one of the conditionalities around um, transparency and efficiency is this idea of the digitization of, of payments via e-wallet. Um, and of course, the, that raises a whole set of other problems in the context of Mozambique, because only 25% of the population have access to cell phones. And in fact, the budget allocated for the payment of cash transfers through a private provider, in this case, it's a cell phone company called Movitel, is nearly double that which it costs to pay public sector unionized workers right, to deliver the cash transfers manually. And in fact, it's, the contracts are still being negotiated. So there's an interesting process where digitization has been hailed as kind of the response to rapidly 
uh, roll out cash transfers, and indeed in some countries it's worked. But in the case of Mozambique, it's ill-suited um, to, to the context. It costs the state more money, and um, you know it, it's been able to, it's been driven primarily because donors have pushed that uh, as part of kind of a broader strategy around outsourcing. Um, and I think that the South African case raises lots of um, cautionary tales about what happens when you outsource cash transfers to private providers, the bundling of, of, of financial services and so on. Um, so the payments still haven't happened six months on, but it's just this commitment to expand transfers significantly. So, you know, this has then raised the possibilities for uh, civil society organizations to begin thinking about what if what would it mean to have universal basic income or what would it mean to use this emergency grant as a wedge to uh, to to push for something that's universal and unconditional and so then we began to do some of the costings and what you see is that if you expanded the cash transfer as it now is to all individuals um, so it took the idea of universal and unconditional cash transfer paid to all on the basis of citizenship, literally, it would cost 129% of the national budget and 47% of GDP. Because of course, Mozambique's GDP is tiny, as is its national budget, right? It's $5.5 billion. And so then you can begin to play with the numbers to try to get to something that's more acceptable. So we get to, okay, well, maybe we can do two thirds of the lowest poverty line. And that would be 600 metikais, which is, um, about nine dollars for a household, you know, and that would cover 12 percent of the budget. But but the uh, average household in Mozambique is 4.4 people. So by the time you're dividing eight or nine dollars a month by 4.4 people, you're dealing with two dollars a month, right? And so it it it's clear that there's space, there is fiscal space to expand spending for cash transfers in Mozambique. Um, to, uh, currently, Mozambique allocates. 1.6% uh, of the state budget to cash transfer payments and 0.5% of GDP. But how do you expand or how would you introduce universal basic income in a meaningful way while also making sure that you're still keeping those other cash transfers for people that are, you know, have specific vulnerabilities along the life cycle, uh, people with disabilities, the elderly, and so on. So, you know, UBI is not a magic bullet uh, in terms of social welfare provisioning, uh, and nor is it the only form of public spending that's necessary. Uh, and, and so, you know, obviously there's ways also of expanding revenue, curbing listed and illicit financial foes, uh, development aid, uh, reparations of some kind, but I think that the ultimately it, it, you, the process of redistribution cannot be disarticulated from the processes of production. I think too often the debates around UBI assume that production is no longer relevant or that uh, struggles at the point of production are somehow expired. I think the case of Mozambique highlights that without you know, Mozambique is not actually facing a crisis of overproduction. And without expanding the redistributive base, right, there's no way to actually in functionally introduce something like universal basic income, even at the lowest level. Um, and, you know, some James Ferguson will argue that any amount is good enough. Uh, but, but actually, there is something such as an insignificant cash transfer. And in my research on current cash transfer payments, many recipients argued that it's insignificant and would not necessarily struggle for it. So this idea that any amount will then create a, a, a wedge and there'll be this radical politics around the point of redistribution isn't necessarily the case. And of course, that's also mediated by questions of, of, of notions of citizenship, which in the context of Mozambique are fragile. And certainly in the case where this is all being designed with a lot of influence from international development agencies. And the other factor is, of course, what will you consume, right? So uh, if, if, you, if you ignore production and there's a focus on, 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 on basic income, you know, funded perhaps between, by uh, reparations or you know, by development aid, but what will people in, in, in Mozambique consume with that except for inflation? So I think that it's really important in, in, in the Mozambican case, being an agrarian country, to have this articulation between land, labor, and welfare. I think one final cautionary, uh, or, or, or one, sorry, um, I think also here, well, one final cautionary tale, and I'll, 
this raises quickly, is that, you know, the, the history of, I mean, we haven't had universal basic income on a national level really anywhere. But if you take, for instance, the experience of the Speedlum Act in 1795 in the UK, which essentially was an unconditional cash transfer, you saw that where there weren't labor protection, um, then employers use the cash transfer in order to effectively pay workers, right? That happened in 1795. However, it's also happening today. I mean, if you look at the reports of how Walmart's business model, how Walmart has been able to use uh, food stamps in the US, right? And taxpayer money to, to subsidize the salaries of their workers, that's a modern case in point. And it's no wonder, therefore, that Walmart, which is one of the biggest union busters, supports universal basic income. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, universal basic income uh, is often attributed to Thomas Paine as an idea. And he argued in 1797 that it was a way of compensating the expropriated and protecting the land of the landed gentry, right? So I think that in the case of Mozambique, it's very clear that land plays a much more important role, even if insufficient, in supporting people's livelihoods. And you, you want to make sure that you can articulate the three together in order to ensure that people have access to land, that they have, you know, their labor protections are protected as we move towards experimenting with social welfare. I also just want to, I put this up because even though South Africa and Mozambique are neighboring countries, their profiles are actually quite different. So in the same way that there's no magic bullet around social welfare, the, you know, the specificities of countries really matter. Um, and, and so the options that are available on a policy level are also uh, differ. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ruth. This was very interesting. And uh, I, for, for one, have a lot of questions. And um, I hope also some other questions will come in the chat. So please, please feel free to use the chat box um, to ask your questions or raise an issue um, that might have come up. Um, I will certainly come back to some of the questions that I noted down. Um, but for now, let's uh, hand over to Costas um, for another 20 minute presentation and his take on universal basic income. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I must say, I enjoyed the presentation by uh, Ruth, and he was particularly informative. I didn't really know much about the operation of uh, cash transfers in Mozambique, but I do know that you get them in a lot of developing countries. I will discuss, and there are problems uh, with them. I will discuss the question in the context of Spain, which is not a developing country, although some people would argue that much of the south of Europe is now a developing area. So um, there are some similarities. Anyway, thank you very much for the invitation. Let me share the um, uh, PowerPoint. I hope you can see it. Maybe I didn't choose the right, um, the right design for this, but anyway. Um, so the talk is uh, about rethinking UBI in the pandemic crisis. Um, and I think it's from Spain. I want to do two things. Um, I want to say a few things about the crisis and what it means. And I want to place UBI or pandemic basic income in the context of the crisis. So without losing too much time, because I've got not very much time, um, let me, in a sense, um, set out my stall. Um, this is an extraordinary crisis which emerged at the beginning of this year. And it's extraordinary because fundamentally of the role of the state. Uh, there are many issues to this, and I won't touch upon them directly, but I don't think there's any doubt at all that the crisis has demonstrated the colossal power of the nation state uh, at the moment. And actually, it ought to put to bed all these um, uh, debates about the state and the market and the weakness of the state, the state disappearing and various other things which I've spent most of my working life battling against. Um, what disappearing state? The state is everywhere and the state has basically um, dictated uh, the patterns of uh, development and the patterns of movement uh, across global capitalism basically. Particularly 
the crisis, the state has catalyzed the crisis through the lockdowns. Um, and it has also um, taken a precedent the steps to confront it. And taking steps to confront the crisis uh, has meant taking steps uh, against neoliberalism, which isn't the first time that the state has done that, but it is particularly prominent now. Um, because despite all steps taken by the state, the crisis is deep and intractable. It will be with us for a long time. It has affected income and employment of working people. This is a very difficult time coming up in Europe. The winter is going to be very difficult. And of course, inequality has remained um, very high. So a pandemic basic income in that context could be an, an important alternative policy. It is in that context I want to reconsider it. And I want to make that clear by saying a couple of things on the debate on UBI. It is, of course, of long standing. Ruth has just uh, is, is, is given us a taste of that. Um, I don't intend to rehash it here. Um, I want to stress that, of course, there are many issues that one could be concerned about when it comes to UBI. Many um, misgivings, which I have always shared. Um, so in that context, I want to stress at the outset that government be first and foremost uh, concerned with creating and protecting employment and defending minimum wages. Uh, UBI or epidemic basic income shouldn't be a replacement for that. And under no circumstances should UBI be used to supplant other welfare provision, uh, as tends to happen in a number of developing countries. Um, through cash transfers, actually reduce the um, um, the value that goes to uh, working people, and certainly not in more developed countries, welfare provisions must not be supplanted by that. Um, it seems to me that the pandemic basic income should be an additional and important measure to confront poverty and to deal with the, this extraordinary crisis more generally. And the way to ensure its radical uh, dimension is, of course, to discuss how it will be financed and financing it for me, as I will show in a minute, necessarily or preferably involves redistributive tax reform and uh, altered financial uh, arrangements. But let me tell you the story quickly about the crisis, and then we will look at the empirical work on Spain, which I hope substantiates uh, the case uh, more. Um, now, one must start with the crisis of 2007-2009. I'm not going to take too much time. All I will say is that that crisis, which was vast, um, was confronted on, on three levels. There were three levers to confront it. The first was, of course, active and extraordinary monetary policy, uh, quantitative easing, easing, and bringing interest rates down to zero. It's interesting to observe that the funds provided by the state were actually hoarded as reserves, by and large, and they were not much deployed to expand lending or the money supply. In fact, in the United States, with the um, still the paradigm country, household and intra-finance debt declined in the last uh, 10 years as a proportion of GDP, they declined substantially. Corporate debt recovered, um, but um, it didn't do anything terribly stunning during that the decade that followed. Second, fiscal policy was deployed, but it was largely passive, even in the United States where fiscal policy was more widely deployed than in Europe or elsewhere. The U.S. is older than the, than the European Union, and it sustained deficits, and as a result, it secured better rates of growth than Europe, which was appalling for the last 10 years. But of course, the, the, um, the price of that was expanding public debt. If you look at the United States, the debt that really increased the last 10 years is public debt. Um, in a sense, what we need the last 10 years is state financialization. And the third uh, lever that was... Um, deployed uh, to confront the crisis was, of course, aggressive defense of the international role of the dollar by the Fed. This is not much talked about, but it's there, and it, it is indicative of how the world works. Um, now, the result was weak internationalization. That's how I read it. That's how I read the last 10 years. And you can see it in a variety of ways. And I say this because the point I want to make is that the pandemic hit a world economy that was already weak. Was after 10 years of weakened financialization, that the pandemic emerged. Historically weak profitability, both of industry production and finance, 
weak investment and growth, sustained financialization practices by US corporations, particularly share buybacks. The sums are astounding, especially for the large uh, corporates. Um, and crucially, although I won't develop it much, financialization of, develop, develop, of developing countries, sorry, it's a mistake here, financialization of developing countries continued apace. Insofar as we had financialization in the last 10 years, it, is mo it was mostly in developing countries. Now, the crisis hit the, the global economy, particularly the, the developed parts of it, in this weakened position. Um, and really, it was the, for me, it's the unprecedented role of the state that matters for the story of the, uh, of the basic income, because um, the power of the nation state, I think, is currently without historical precedent. I mean, what has happened this year left me, I mean, speechless. There's no other way to describe it. Um, the state catalyzed the crisis through lockdowns. And the lockdowns amounted, amounted to a triple shock, a shock to aggregate supply, um, in a sense, disrupting su supply chains um, globally, but also di disrupting the supply process um, nationally. And obviously, that that created unemployment or a tendency to lay off workers or keep workers on the books, but not working particularly. Uh, the lockdowns also affected aggregate demand, but the impact on demand was mixed. Uh, to a certain extent, demand declined, but to, to, to an important extent, the demand was rearranged among different sectors. And obviously, the lockdowns hit financial markets, particularly global financial flows, which declined in the beginning, and stock markets. Uh, but crucially, the state also confronted the crisis by, um, uh, by going against uh, neoliberalism. And here, there's a bit of a problem with my... Um, no, there is no problem with my uh, slides. When they're, they're okay. Uh, the state did, 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 confronted the crisis using the three, using essentially the three levers they used in 2007, 2009, but in a different way. Um, monetary policy was again deployed, active and even more extraordinary than in 2007, 2009. Um, what this did was to uh, bring interest rates down to zero, expand reserves extraordinarily. And the result of the expansion of reserves this time was actually to increase bank lending and the money supply, which we didn't see last time. Uh, the figures for the United States um, for M3, for M2 and so on, in terms of the growth of um, lending to corporates, and money supply growth are extraordinary. There hasn't been a jump in those aggregate ever uh, since they started to be um, uh, composed, basically. It is precisely this that allowed, of course, the, the stock markets to come back. So much for the efficient market hypothesis. What efficient market hypothesis? The, the stock markets have actually behaved in the way that the state has made them behave. We're in the midst of an extraordinary um, boom again uh, in, in, the stock, in the stock markets entirely uh, sustained by the extraordinary growth of um, uh, of money and credit uh, which the state catalyzed um, the increase in the uh, balance sheet of the central bank is without precedent in in the united states so that was the first thing the first lever i'll come back to it the second is of course extraordinary fiscal policy and that's where things are different and UBI can, could potentially come into it. Extraordinary fiscal policy compared to 2007-2009, because this time fiscal policy was active. Uh, and it was active pretty much across the developed world with, with differences, and the differences matter. What we witnessed is without precedent. Essentially, we witnessed the nationalization of the wage bill of large numbers of corporates, including large corporates, because that's what the furlough is, and that's what paying people's... Uh, wages to keep them on the books um, basically amounts to nationalizing the wage bill. So, uh, at the same time, governments, a lot of governments in developed countries nationalize the income statement uh, because effectively they guarantee uh, enterprises against um, losses and therefore bankruptcy. And third, 
and equally crucial, there were direct subventions of cash on a large scale households, the United States sending money to people through the post. Um, so extraordinary fiscal policy uh, interventions, which of course resulted in huge deficits. Um, I will have occasion to say a couple of things about those in a minute. And the third thing is, of course, again, not much talked about, but of crucial importance, aggressive defense of the international role of the dollar by the Fed. The Fed made sure that the dollar would not be challenged as the global reserve currency, insofar as that was within the power of the, of the Fed. Now, let me move on and come to the point. All that has happened while core periphery divisions in the world have become intensified. And for my purposes, this matters in the European Union. The European Union is, in, is a very interesting case because it has, uh, in a sense, rediscovered rediscovered the historic core periphery uh, uh, division in capitalism in a new format. Um, now, I don't want to go over the history of it. We all pretty much understand that there is a, there is a core to, to the European Union and um, uh, a number of peripheries. The periphery that matters to me here is, of course, the southern periphery, Spain, fundamentally, Portugal, um, Greece, and most of Italy, or large parts of Italy. Um, here, what matters is that the, the intensification of this uh, core periphery uh, division meant that the hit of, the, of coronavirus and the impact of the crisis was differentially felt and meant that southern countries could deal with the crisis much less effectively than um, core countries. The difference between Germany and um, say Spain or other parts of the periphery in this respect is, is now uh, tremendous. Um, how? Let me say a few words and then we'll move on to Spain. In the course of the crisis, and partly because of the intensified um, uh, division between core and periphery, the, East, the, 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 the European Union proceeded to um, change its mode of operation substantially, making the nation state more important than before. People think that what we see in the European Union is actually uh, at the moment, um, somehow a move towards greater federalism. Precisely the opposite is happening. Actually, everything we see is um, tends towards the strengthening of the role of the nation state, which is what the crisis has done across the world. Um, the ECB has loosened this mandate even further in order to provide liquidity. The Stability and Growth Pact was suspended. State aid and cushion policy was suspended. And then next generation EU was adopted based on commission borrowing and uh, fiscal transfers. Um, these steps were steps which basically indicate that uh, the core powers understood that the, the, the union faced um, uh, tensions that might lead to, um, uh, to, 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 to a breakup. Um, and measures were taken. I believe that in that context, German conditional hegemony in the European Union has been boosted, and the southern periphery found it very difficult to handle the fiscal requirements of the crisis. Essentially, if the crisis required extraordinary fiscal intervention, as it does, the southern state could not face it, could not handle it in, 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 in Europe because um, of the subordinate position in the European Union because of the extraordinary volume of debt they've got and because of the um, restrictions on uh, fiscal policy, basically. So let's go to Spain and let's see what this means. Uh, we'll show you the, um, I'll show you the, um, some of the empirics we've extracted. If you look at Spain as an exemplar of how the crisis hit the South, the fall in, the, in GDP is conservative for this year, conservatively expected at 10%. I think it's conservative, but let's say it will be 10%. And it's roughly what will be in other uh, southern countries. The result, of course, has been um, the exacerbation of poverty, deprivation, inequality by all the evidence we've got uh, in our hands for this uh, period. The Spanish government, aware of this, introduced uh, the policy of minimum vital income on the 1st of June 2020. I don't want to give you the details of it. Essentially, it's a policy of income support for um, poorer uh, families, but already it's apparent that it doesn't work well, um, reaching perhaps only 23%, according to the latest figures 
of those uh, facing material, um, severe material um, uh, deprivation is a mistake here, yeah, not several, severe material deprivation. Crucially, the policy is very bureaucratic. It creates obstacles for people who are entitled. It puts people off from claiming it. And that's a major problem with all policies of this um, type. It's in this context that Spain right now could do well, would do well to consider um, a pandemic basic income. Um, and the policy that the paper I've done with uh, three of my colleagues from Spain uh, would, would have this um, format. Um, we propose for debate, um, we propose that um, the government opens up online, online applications for a pandemic basic income that basically require one bank account per adult. It will, check, it will check the number of claimants. Payments will be made monthly. Um, income tax will be filled next year. No tax will be paid on the pandemic basic income. It would supersede other cash subsidies, but without loss to the recipient. And if it is illegally claimed, it will, it will be put next year. We uh, argued that there could be two possible cases to run from May to December 2020. Uh, one would be based on the standard estimate of the threshold of the at risk in poverty in Spain. Spain. The other would be based on the modified OECD scale. Uh, the first would be PBI provided to, to individuals. The second would be PBI provided to households. Um, and we then engaged in two simulations. Both of them would be uh, as a right, provided as a right. We then engaged in two simulations to engage to assess the outcomes, assuming 100% coverage and 50% coverage. And the simulations. Um, here and uh -huh. here, yeah, yeah, I know. I, I'll, yeah. I'll just sum it up. Yeah, right. Uh, so the the estimates then show you th this, and I, I must say that uh, they depend on the multiplier. We estimated the multiplier, and we found that if the policy is adopted, GDP would be boosted through uh, increased consumption. In other words, there's a demand effect, which would lead to employment and output. Uh, um, effects and tax intake would increase, and there would be savings on unemployment benefits and other welfare subventions. The net expenditure by the government would be 43% of the gross expenditure. And in terms of GDP, it depends on the coverage, varying between 7.2% and 3.3% of GDP. We, uh, we also engaged in sensitivity um, analysis, and all the outcomes indicate that it is perfectly, um, perfectly uh, manageable. Now, one more, one more point, Tobias, I promise you not stop. This is affordable. The question is how to finance it, though, because there is still a net gap. How to finance it? The net cost will require redistributive tax reform. It's very clear, and it should be said, taxing wealth, higher incomes, and corporate profits. We also estimated that with a single, with, even with a single income tax rate of 46 to 49 percent, we can have a more progressive tax system in Spain if a uh, basic income is introduced, because of course there will be benefits from the from the basic income. Now, in effect, then uh, a PBI would be a, an income transfer from the richest 20% to the poorest 50% uh, in Spain. If the government doesn't want to engage in tax reform, it could also borrow. Borrowing is not a preferable policy, although it could be done, and it's not a preferable policy because, of course, it gives extra rights to the owners of loanable capital of future um, on future value creation but it could be done um, although it would involve a conflict with the eu it is up to the government to the spanish government to do it and it is up to the progressive forces in spain uh, to demand it the preferable policy however is tax reform to finance it so in that context to sum up the pandemic basic income strategy would make sense those who advocate and wish to advocate policies to challenge neoliberalism should consider it seriously because the crisis is deep. It will be with us for a long time and it will not be dealt with without uh, dramatic measures such as this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kostas. Um, and now I would hand over to Shaira. Um, Shaira, are you there? Yes. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? <laughs> yeah, perfect. 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm really happy to be with you. I'll try to keep my uh, feedback brief and then go into some of my, my thoughts that I'd put down to share with you all today. Um, I just wanted to reiterate what Ruth said about this being a very important day. Um, locally, this month is also quite significant in South Africa because five years ago, um, this month in October, the general strikes by our largest trade unions were also aligned with the fees must fall protests that were taking place across the country for decolonized and decommodified education. And these demands reverberated even uh, to SOAS, um, as I believe. So I'm very happy to be joining you today. Um, and now we find ourselves again on the picket lines for a number of demands, including the demand for basic income guarantee. So two quick points from the presentations. Um, in terms of Ruth, uh, you know, saying that the devil is in the details, I totally agree. Uh, one point that you mentioned that really uh, resonated with some of the challenges we've been having in South Africa uh, is the digitization of payments in the COVID grant. Um, this was proposed, it was a very uh, small scale pilot project that was supposedly being carried out by the Department of Social Development and our social grant agency, SASA. And um, there, were, there was no good transparency around where these machines were coming from. And there was also concern that in a country with such a huge digital divide, such as South Africa, that this was premature and really not needed. It was also ironic that the fastest way to get grants to people, which is through the, the, the offices, the SASA offices, um, SASA offices were actually operating at a third of their capacity at the height of the lockdown when people needed their grants and when the new COVID grant was actually announced, which is the first time in South Africa that we've actually had a grant which goes to unemployed people. Um, and that meant that millions more people were eligible, up to 15 million from our calculations. Um, and we've seen that the implementation of the COVID grant has been dismal in that 4.3 million people have been paid with a remaining 4.3 million people who still have applied for it but haven't heard back or been paid. Um, although the implementation has been really bad, the uh, surveys uh, that have been carried out show that the, the, the um, grant itself has hugely benefited people who have been lucky enough to receive it. So this is a further case for extending these grants because they're currently uh, temporary in South Africa. But I also wanted to touch on um, some of the things that Costa said um, and that, you know, we need to spend a little bit more thinking about uh, on the proposal itself and its technical resonances with South Africa. Like I said, the digital divide is a challenge for us. But in my activism, I've learned that we should learn from everyone and copy no one. I think that what's really interesting from your presentation is the uh, multipliers for aggregate demand. Um, and that has also been considered uh, to an extent in South Africa. There are calculations that have been made, uh, but we've also come under difficulty and challenges in terms of the ability to claw back through taxation, given the universal rollout that we'd hopefully like to, to have. Uh, the three uh, conditions for uh, the kind of big that we would want are briefly a big that is unconditional, that is universal, and that is redistributive in its nature. Um, so to, to just go back to a few of the points that I wanted to raise, um, the, globally the world's largest corporations are making billions at the expense of low-wage workers and funneling profits to shareholders and billionaires, a small group of largely white men in rich nations, uh, the richest 22 men in the world own more than all the women in Africa, and that is around 325 million people. And how this wealth is generated needs serious accountability. So when we talk about redistribution, we don't just mean it in a local sense. We also mean a global consideration of what redistribution could mean and what our imagination could uh, could, 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 could uh, where our imaginations could take us, given the, the portal that we hope the pandemic can be to a better uh, reality. But it makes my stomach turn to think that Jeff Bezos could personally pay each of Amazon's 876,000 employees 
a one-time $105,000 bonus today and still be as wealthy as he was at the beginning of the pandemic. And Yanis Varoufakis describes a big as a way to civilize this kind of crony capitalism. But to what extent is the big mere reform? Uh, and do we want to just civilize capitalism? Of course not, um, but we have to start somewhere. And uh, we can't fight a revolution on an empty stomach. Historically, socialists have supported reforms that are progressive, and this is definitely one of those reforms. So as the C19 People's Coalition and the Cash Transfers Working Group, we have been unequivocal about our support for basic income guarantee. But do we see a UBIG as a way of appropriating wealth that is not providing its social function? And is wealth supposed to provide a social function? For this, the state is essential as it represents the future at the table. At least it should represent the future at the table. And in many cases, it doesn't. So how are we as society, as academics, as um, economists who are progressive going to try and deal and agitate with these realities? In South Africa right now and the world over, there are hegemonic ideas that cloud our judgment, like the myth of a deserving poor, uh, when we know that poverty is structural like the myth, of, uh, the myth that hard work leads to success when we know that unemployment is systemic. And even the myth that unemployment is as a result of uh, inadequate education systems. Many people are still extremely tied to the idea of wage labor. And only some have come to the realization that they could just be exploited workers with Stockholm syndrome. Uh, so we cannot ignore that while big is our best option right now. What people really want is still jobs. But the idea of jobs guarantees in South Africa is concerning because we have an extremely corrupt state and money going directly to people is arguably a safer bet. So this contention is very strong in South Africa. Uh, while these hegemonies are being questioned and as one of the most unequal countries in the world, we really want to use the energy of this moment where people face the possible termination of the new COVID grant that I mentioned was instituted uh, at the beginning of the lockdown uh, to fight for a basic income guarantee. So our demand at the moment is that there can be no termination of the COVID grant or the top ups that have been made to the existing grants uh, without the commitment to a basic income guarantee and it's uh, uh, close to immediate realization. There are technocrats who say that it would take years to implement this, but we who have been on the ground and are in communities understand that we can't afford years, that it does need to be immediate and that it does need to be taken with urgency. The fact that over 5 million people are at risk of falling below the poverty line uh, if the current grant stops in October should be enough reason to ensure that it continues. Uh, the government's reluctance to transform the COVID grant into a permanent basic income exposes really its unimaginative and incorrect viewing of wage labor as the main mechanism for dignified livelihood. And by all accounts in South Africa and across the world, wage labor has failed to deliver. In, uh, in South Africa, more than half of our population lives below the working poverty line of around $300 per month, despite being employed. So contrary to stereotypes of laziness, uh, grants have been important in supporting job seeking. Uh, for example, by paying for childcare or transport for caregivers or to buy stock to establish or run small businesses, which is very common in South Africa. Research has shown that um, money for social grant grants is largely spent on food, clothing, transport, healthcare, and education, with grant recipients still eager to find work. The child support grant, for example, has reduced hunger and improved school attendance um, and health. But negative views on social assistance are generally more common in established welfare states with lower unemployment rates, better access to services, and higher social assistance benefits than South Africa. And I'm sure Costas can weigh in on that. Um, the latest national income dynamics survey, the Coronavirus Rapid Mobile Survey in South Africa, has shown that. Um, we really have an, uh, 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 hunger has doubled and um, over and above that, 
the improvement in the economy that we would have hoped to see after the, the, the lowering of the highest lockdown restrictions has not actually been achieved. So the crisis is far from over. But when we think about basic income guarantees, and I'm heading towards my conclusion here, there are two questions that come to mind. The first one is who will benefit from it? And the second is where's the wealth that is going to pay for it coming from? And both of you have touched on this. But I think what is also equally important is where the demand itself comes from. And this is where the political mobilization is really crucial. So there are obvious challenges among civil society. Agreeing on a number has been a challenge. But suggestions have ranged from the upper bound poverty line of around $76 to, um, the, uh, to, uh, to $119, which is closer to the minimum wage, but not quite there. And of course, the ruling party's political branches have also been weighing in on this quite heavily. And their suggestion is uh, a meager amount that is below the food poverty line of $29. So we're all aware of the fact that while even a very small amount still benefits people on the margins, the transformative power of a big is really in it being sufficient. And so if it's very low, that is a challenge for, for how we can justify um, that it is not just uh, the kind of big that Walmart or um, Elon Musk uh, are, are supporters of. Um, and unfortunately, it seems like our political elite still believes that grants create dependency. Uh, so that being said, the big, like um, uh, Ruth has said, is not a silver bullet. And we specifically been saying that we would like a basic income guarantee and not a grant because the language is so important. A guarantee reiterates everyone's moral and social right to the economy through a redistributive justice framework. A big will have to be financed, of course, by taxing the rich, but it will also have to form part of a broader plan for restructuring the economy with a focus on radical and targeted in industrial policy, human development, strong accessible public services, We've had a situation in South Africa where people use their grant money to buy clean water. Uh, that is just something that we, you know, we cannot continue uh, to justify. And the way the pandemic has impacted on society, increasing poverty and unemployment, makes the big and urgent necessity now. Um, and lastly, in South Africa, there are talks of a so solidarity fund, which would come from the richest of the population, and it's similar to what you suggested, Costas, that is, you know, conversations that are happening there. But globally, COVID-19 pandemic profits tax is something that Oxfam has spoken about, and I think it is a proposal that is quite interesting. Uh, one thing that I'm wary of is the idea that we need to recover, because it implies that we go back to where we, where we were before, and that is definitely no, not where we need to go. So many of us can hopefully agree that the pandemic must be a catalyst for reigning in corporate power, restructuring business, holding the state accountable, um, and most importantly, I think in our situation, delinking the obsession with waged work and dignified livelihoods. And this also needs to take into consideration things like odious debt and the unequal ecological exchanges, which have centered the destructive economic growth that we have seen to chart a new path going forward. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sharia. That was very interesting. Um, and you touched upon a lot of different aspects, I think, that both Kostas and Ruth uh, can come back to. So uh, I'll just hand over real quick uh, to Ruth and then to Kostas for just a quick um, response to what Shaira was raising, and then uh, we go to the questions. So Ruth, just really quick, though, so we have, because we only have 18 minutes left. Yeah, um, I, don't, I think Shaira really raised great questions, and I don't necessarily have anything to add. I'd be interested in hearing from others. Great. Thanks. Costas? Yeah, what the, I mean, I obviously agree with uh, most of these points. Um, there's no question that the primary uh, concern of uh, forces that wish to bring change should be the creation of employment, minimum wages, conditions of labor, uh, 
productive restructuring, productive economy that, uh, that, that improves the productivity of labor, greater equality, the usual stuff, welfare provision, none of that should be supplanted by policies of this type. And uh, as you know, there's a big debate on uh, UBI and UBI can also be advocated by some very, um, how shall I put this, um, unlikable people who um, have got different names. And um, some of the uses to which these cash transfers have been put in developing countries are very, very problematic, as Ruth mentioned uh, already in the case of uh, Mozambique. So one has to be very, very careful and recognize the debates that, that, that have occurred and use them in the context of the pandemic crisis. If appropriately hedged, if thought through, then there is room for uh, and scope for a policy of this type to deal with the extraordinary impact of poverty uh, and impoverishment um, in the southern periphery of Europe, never mind elsewhere, uh, where incomes are already low. Now, having said this, the capacity for delivery of a program such as the one that I've outlined is, of course, very variable and very different in some developing countries compared to Spain, where uh, the ability to provide welfare services are at a different level, but also the ability to manage a complex digital system such as the one that I've outlined is, uh, again, a different level, say, to Mozambique or, or, or even to South Africa. So um, one has to take all these things uh, into account. But a debate is what the left needs because um, it's been absent, really, from the debates of, the, um, uh, of what's been happening with coronavirus, and that's an important issue. And the last point I want to make is the point, again, that Saira made. It must be connected to tax reform because otherwise it's like saying that this is the magic money tree. I know some among the radicals believe that the magic money tree has been discovered, but I, I tell you they hasn't. So there has to be, um, there has to be tax reform. Uh, we've estimated what it is in the case of Spain. In that way, there has to be a, a shift of resources. There is no free lunch in this way. Someone's got to, to, to support that. And that must be, of course, the better off, the rich. Um, and their wealth must be taxed. Corporates must face the taxation, the, the high income brackets must face taxation. Otherwise, such a policy becomes difficult to sustain um, in the medium term. Thank you very much, Kostos. Um, there were a few questions in the chat box about financing and financing universal basic income. Uh, so maybe we can we can talk about that a little bit. Uh, Neil raised the question about or raised the point that the stock market seems to be completely divor divorced from realities that you know, the point that Costas was also making about financialization, the point that also Sharia was making about the way in which Amazon and others have largely benefited from this crisis, whereas others, um, specifically workers in the global north as well as in the global south, have not. And I think here as well, and, 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 and maybe the, that question can go to Ruth, is the, is the question of you know, creating fiscal policy space in this financialized global economy that has created additional uh, burdens on uh, the debt of uh, Global South countries specifically. So how within uh, this, uh, this new reality in which we find ourselves in, can we create in, uh, specifically in the Global South uh, enough fiscal policy space in this current context with uh, rising debt levels and, uh, and sort of a, a credit crunch almost for, uh, for countries in the Global South? And uh, another question that was raised um, by Rebecca, um, I think it was Rebecca, um, about, no, sorry, that was Cecilia's question about sort of how to think uh, about universal basic income on a more global level um, as well. So she asked, uh, how, can we, how can we push that on, for example, on, on the UN level, UNCTAD maybe, uh, um, one of the organizations that could help with that, but also maybe for Costas, would it make more sense to push for a universal basic income on a European level than just focus on, on Spain as such? So this, these, these are questions may be interesting uh, and they came, they came out of the chat box to some extent. And then we'll come to the question on universal basic services after that. So maybe start with Ruth on, on the financing for the Global South. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you for those questions. So if you take the case of Mozambique, um, it's opted, as many African countries have, for a resource-driven development model, right? 
And the bulk of uh, private investment in Mozambique goes to the extractive sector um, and associated infrastructure. And following the financial crisis, you saw a proliferation of public-private partnerships around infrastructure projects related with the speculative boom around coal and gas in Mozambique, right? Roads and railroads and things being built and displacing much of the infrastructure and services that were there um, to support people in everyday life. You know, so an example is the investment that went into the Val railway that takes coal to the port and then passenger traffic being completely derailed and with it all the forms of little trade that happened along that railroad. And Mozambique, through public-private partnerships, actually incurred a huge amount of public debt, but hidden debt, right, that wasn't clearly visible until, until um, the debt crisis. So I think that what we've seen is that the Mozambique's own development strategy is, is one that's centered on sectors that don't produce jobs, so highly capital intensive, and contributively little to the fiscus because of all fiscal exemptions that they get in order to invest in the country in this kind of rat race to get investment. Uh, so I think that we need to be thinking um, about beyond right this resource driven model and 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 redefining the terms um, of, of of foreign investment and how it comes into the country and I think that you know someone raised the question around tax agreements and certainly global tax agreements are something that we have to think about because these corporations are of a global dimension and money is moved all over the place and oftentimes not even coming um, into the country so I think I will leave it there. Um, Thank you. Um, um, to Costas, and also the question was raised, uh, maybe that also relates to what I said about the European level, if it would be more feasible in Scandinavian countries. Mao asked that question, so maybe you can also... Yeah, let me let me take these questions quickly. I know we're running out of time. Um, uh, the, the question asked by, uh, I believe, Rebecca, Rebecca on universal basic services. In principle, I'm in favor of universal basic, basic services. I'm in, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in favor of provision in terms of use values, in terms of material things, in terms of free access to people, to a health system, uh, to transport, uh, and so on. In principle, I'm in favor of that. That is, that would be a more equitable way that avoids the um, intervention of money, which can create problems, as well as being fungible, of course, because money is fungible. Um, so in principle, I'm in favor of that, uh, indeed. However, as says, we are facing a major problem, which is actually an immediate problem. This is going to be a very difficult time coming up in Europe and a very difficult time coming up in a number of countries. I mean, it's going to be a difficult winter for a lot of people. So the, the, the policies we're advocating and we've estimated were from May to December of this year. So we're thinking of this as an immediate intervention, which comes tomorrow. This, this is... Uh, if. if if we decided upon it, it could happen tomorrow. Now, whether we sustain it in the in the longer term, that's a different question. That's what we need to discuss. That's what the that's what we need to engage in a discussion over whether it makes sense and to what extent does it make sense together with other uh, other interventions. Now, the the the, the point that Mao made about um, uh, implementing it more easily in some welfare states, it's possible. We would have to look at it concretely in the concrete. But certainly, Scandinavian. Um, countries, what I know about them, which isn't that much, um, have got the capacity to deliver such, uh, such a program and to combine it with provision in kind. Um, the point then that Cecilia made on financing basic income, given the interconnectedness of the global economy and the question of Europe. If you expect the European Union to provide adequate basic income for the South and to provide it on a sort of uh, European uh, uniform basis, you'd wait a long time. Um, the, the crisis would be long over, and so would be up the south before that happens. Um, the, 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 issue, the issue here is to uh, intervene quickly, and the power that gets in Europe right now is the nation state, uh, as it has demonstrated. As it's happening also in Germany, as it happens, which is running at the moment, from what I understand, pilot programs in, um, in, in, in basic income. Um, provision and we wait to see what will be decided. Now, for financing it, it still is within the powers of the state to tax. Uh, it hasn't, that, that hasn't gone away. It still is within the powers of the state to tax and the, the, the global dimension doesn't really uh, 
come into it that much. The state can tax to do it. It can it can rearrange the system. It can it can bring about uh, an income transfer from the rich to the poorer by advocating tax reform, by introducing tax reform and imposing it. It's a matter of political will. It's got nothing to do with uh, uh, international uh, uh, impediments or, or, or anything uh, of the sort. Uh, finally, the question by uh, by Max on Bernardis' proposal to tax employers. It is, of course, true that if you provide <coughs> Um, a basic income, you're given uh, an excuse or a, a way for unscrupulous employers, and there are plenty of those about, to um, um, to undercut wages, of course, to not, not to pay wages. To, to, to And that has happened in the course of the pandemic crisis. Uh, we know of, of uh, a lot of um, um, anecdotal evidence that uh, uh, people have not been paid by their enterprises. Uh, because when they were supposed to be paid. Um, so um, it happens and it will happen. How you tackle that, it will depend. I, I don't. I haven't done the, uh, the figures for the proposal by Sanders. I don't know. I can't tell you how it would work. But in principle, yes, I would be in favor of, um, of regulatory intervention to make sure that the employers, the employers do not take advantage of uh, basic income provision not to pay the wages that they were um, supposed to, to pay. That is not an easy thing. So um, uh, although UBI is, could be easy to introduce in terms of um, in the way that we propose, in terms of avoiding bureaucratic uh, 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 impediments, everybody could have it as a right, or 50% of the population would have it as a right. Yeah, there could be, there could be complexities um, coming later, but no, but no one, no one ever said that social policy is easy. The last point I would make is this. We can think of UBI as social policy, and you'd be right to do so. But the point that I made as well here, and the simulations we did indicated it, it isn't just equality policy or welfare policy. It is also aggregate demand policy. There is also a dimension of boosting aggregate demand, which in the case of the South is very, very important. Our simulations, simple as they are, based on, the, on an estimate of multiplier, which is reasonable, indicate that such a policy would ameliorate the recessionary impact of the crisis very substantially in the case of Spain, possibly uh, elsewhere in the south of Europe. Too. Thank you very much, Kostas. Um, also, I, I would um, like to ask uh, Sharia for uh, also her view on financing. Specifically, you brought in the dimension um, as well, uh, this global dimension of redistribution. You mentioned the sort of racialized, gendered global workforce um, um, as as, a, as an important aspect uh, to think about the global dimension of redistribution. So maybe you can go into that a little bit further and specifically on how uh, how to finance um, universal basic income given the sort of reduced fiscal policy space that might now now be found also in uh, in South Africa. Yeah, I mean, I won't take too long on this one because um, I do think it's a it's an area that we're all kind of putting our heads together in. Uh, what I will say is that when it comes to the conceptions of um, redistributive justice, and from a South African perspective, there's a lot to say about land redistribution, about um, the importance of those mechanisms that have been so neglected in our democratic transition. Um, and there's also the importance of Africa as a continent uh, being exploited uh, globally. Um, and that, that is where the unequal ecological exchange issue comes into play. I would say that if we were to be honest about issues around debt, there's a question around odious debt when it comes to our power utility, uh, public power utility, ESCOM, for example, and the loans that were taken from the World Bank. It's interesting to me that those loans were admitted by the World Bank to be corrupt loans that should never have actually been approved and that would qualify as odious debt. Um, and there are mechanisms to, for example, newly, uh, I think, sue the World Bank, but these are not conversations that you see taking place um, across the globe. And it, 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 it's interesting to me because it shows our limitations of how we think about redistributive justice and how comfortable we make it for 
political um, and global elites, uh, both locally uh, and across the board, to continue um, the status quo. And as an activist, I think that these are conversations we need to start having more. I know in South Africa, when it comes to uh, the growing reservations around austerity, there's um, an important uh, legislative opportunity uh, that public interest uh, law, law organizations are considering on how we can use the constitution and, and try and do that. But again, it, 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 it is very limited to um, our own na national uh, disposition. And I do think that when we think about the coronavirus pandemic, it's made us realize just how connected we all are. And it also has to make us realize that when it comes to the vaccine, when it comes to practical issues like fixing the patent laws and ensuring that um, African countries don't kind of just get thrown into the backdrop again and are uh, you know, having to pay much more than required to access life-saving medications. These are all things that we consider in a fiscal conversation about how we'd be able to firstly uh, free up money to afford a big and secondly have some form of redistributive justice that isn't just uh, located in our own uh, geographical compound. Thank you very much for this. Um, I, we are running out of time, um, and also this is a good a way to, I think, to end this, uh, this session for today. Unless, Ruth, you have any burning, you have anything burning to say, any conclusion that you want to draw? No, not at all. Not at all? Great. Um, well, first and foremost, let me thank you so much for this very, very interesting, uh, these interesting presentation and the interesting discussion that we had. Um, I learned a lot, certainly, um, and um, also it already foreshadows a lot of the things that we will discuss in the webinar series, particularly uh, the role of the World Bank that Shaira at the end um, pointed towards uh, is uh, our discussion next week, um, where we have a panel discussion exactly on that, uh, the sort of the World Bank response to COVID-19 uh, entitled Never Let a Pandemic Go to Waste, where we have several speakers from our department and from uh, UWE Bristol um, and the Nawi Antifem Macroeconomics Col uh, Collective. So please also join us next week when we speak more about that. But uh, more generally, the, how, how this uh, discussion also showed that there is this global dimension uh, to this current crisis and there, are, there have to be global responses to uh, a more just and environmental sustainable uh, future coming out of this crisis. And this is exactly something that we want to sort of uh, help to shape this discourse with this webinar series. And it was a fantastic way to start. So thank you. Thank you very much again to all speakers. Um, and uh, just to quote Shaira, uh, we can't fight a revolution on empty stomach. So please uh, uh, enjoy your dinner or lunches or breakfast from wherever you join, uh, join us today. Um, and we do hope that we see you next week. Um, so thank you very much for joining and goodbye now. Thank you.